You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast. It is episode seven of season three, the philosophy of Craig Council. Don't forget to listen, download, review. Most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on the socials, Fly the W670 on Twitter, Instagram. Of course, we're on Facebook. And you can email us at flythew670 at gmail.com. Crowley, happy uh, new week. We are a week closer to uh, pitchers and catchers reporting what on Valentine's Day and then a full squad on the uh, 19th of February. Yeah, the, the, the time is ticking. And, and so hopefully, you know, with, with all this like frozen ice storms and all this stuff, I'm I'm ready for spring training right now. I'll tell you that much. Oh, yeah. Nothing uh, Nothing screams the want and need of spring training after, uh, what, 40-plus hours of below zero without the wind chill, and now we've got uh, freezing rain on the way, and then everything's going to melt, and it's going to be a big sloppy mess. Yeah, like I said, it, when that plane lands and I'm in Mesa, and, and all of a sudden you just see, like, the glorious sunshine, it, it, it's – it's so it's so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I bet. All right. So we've got some pretty cool uh, sound we want to go back to from uh, Cubs Con. It's stuff that we uh, borrowed off the Marquee Sports Network and 670 The Score. Uh, finding out a little bit more about the uh, number one free agent signing so far of the Cubs this offseason. Yeah. When we talk about Craig Council, I mean, like I said, there, to me, it was probably one of the most interesting sessions very informative, just kind of getting to know him as a person, you know? And, and so I thought it was really good, but you know, uh, Jed and Carter, we talked about them on the last episode. They were asked specifically about the hiring of Craig council and the firing of Dave Ross. And, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's clear to me why these guys want, especially after listening to Craig, but, but, this is what um, they had to say when it came to hiring Craig Council. I feel like with Craig, um, we all watched him for so long. We've competed against him. And it was just impossible not to watch what he's done and have just the utmost respect. Not just because of, you know, his in-game stuff. Not just because of, the, you know, the way the team responds. But the... the, the totality of it every single year it felt like he was he put that puzzle together in such a great manner you know that some years they had better offense some years they had a dominant bullpen last year they went almost pure defense and run prevention uh, to win and he just he finds a way to, to do it and it, it was impossible not to admire that and you know one of the things that really struck me I, I sat down with him in that meeting and we were talking strategy and going through some stuff at one point he was like hey if you want to hire me for strategy like don't do that like that's not what i'm about i think i'm good at it and he had launched into all of the team building stuff and the culture and what he creates and i was like it was just such a great moment because i think that so oftentimes people focus on the x's and o's which he's very good at but he sees himself as a team builder, a roster builder, just a, a guy who, who is very good at bringing the entire group together. And that's certainly what we've seen from afar. And, you know, I'm really excited to, to work with him. You know, Carter and I have been really impressed with everything so far and um, look forward to a great relationship with him. So there's going to be a couple of themes that you really want to kind of listen to. And then that was one of the big ones is that, a lot of people just assume that, you know, Craig Council is a very good, you know, strategist, but they kind of don't give him a lot of credit for the culture that he builds in the clubhouse. And that was something that both Jed, Carter, and Craig all talked about at length is, is it's, you know, 162 games and what, 185 days. And, and I was one of those people, Dustin, I, I would tell you for years, you know, I think Craig Council is the best manager in the national league. And I, I, I always just kind of felt that looking from afar, same with, with, uh, you know, with Jed, you know, I would say to myself, God, why does this team always somehow find a way to win and to be competitive? And it's been that way ever since he, you know, he came to Milwaukee. Oh, he's, listen, he, from afar, right. You're jealous of how good he is. And that's part of uh, what my disdain was for this in the <laughs> beginning and looking at him and his, smugness and everything else. But listen, I, I've been, I've come around, I've been sold on him. So onward and upward and only hoping he can deliver as much as uh, they've promised that he can deliver. 
And and I love these little stories, I guess, because it kind of gives you a peek behind the window of, of how all of this happened. And and so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this is this is what Carter Hawkins had to say about Craig. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of doubling down on Jet's point, like, yes, the strategy aspect is important. And yes, we feel very comfortable that he understands that at a really high level. But a, a really interesting anecdote from you know this week. So we had some of those younger players in town are, you know, quote unquote prospects. We I say that with a grimace because like we just don't know who's going to be really good. There's probably someone we didn't invite out here that's going to be an all-star. Um, and we'll do everything to make sure that that happens. Um, but those prospects were in town and, and counts talked to them. And one of the players asked, hey, what do you expect from me my first day in the big leagues? And the answer typically is, well, I expect you to come in. I expect you to say hello to me in the manager's office prior to anybody, you know, prior to you talking to anybody else. And I expect you to go over to the veterans and say hello to them. And I expect you to get into the trainer's room before everyone else so that you don't take anyone else's time and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these X's and O's. And Counts thought about it for a second when the question was asked to him and said, I expect you to be nervous. And the players just realized, like, okay, he cares about me. He cares about me as a person. He cares about me as a human. And I think that is a type of thing that allows a manager to be able to execute on the X's and O's with 100% of the player. And uh, that's something that clearly he was able to do really, really well in Milwaukee, and we're looking forward to having him do it here. Yeah, one of the things he said, um, that it was just so smart and people don't say it enough, is, He's like, the expectation when these young players come up is that they're going to struggle, and we have to have that expectation that if you expect them to struggle, then you work through their struggles with them. The struggle doesn't become disappointment. Because I think that it's so unbelievably hard to transition to the big leagues now, harder than it ever has been. The gap between the minors and the majors is way bigger than it used to be. And so it was just a really astute observation that if you expect a struggle, you'll help them work through it. And you won't be disappointed. That's what you should expect them when they come in. And the other is is wonderful if it if it happens. Uh, here's the thing. I I honestly believe now that that when you if you listen to the last podcast that we did, and we had um, from baseball's perspective, he mentioned that he felt that the Cubs had the number two farm system. Jeffrey was talking, and he said he felt that he had the Cubs had a number two farm system. So to have a manager that understands young players, I think is the other big theme that you're going to hear throughout some of this. Absolutely. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Great point, Crowley. Great. That is going to be huge. And part of me, Dustin is sitting back and saying to myself, I still think that they are going to get Cody Bellinger, but I think on other moves, I think that they don't want to block anybody for some of these young guys to come up. And they want Craig council to be the one that really kind of works with these kids, obviously his whole coaching staff, but, but just that idea of I expect you to be nervous and, and, and to be understanding as a coach, you know what I mean? Because a lot of times there is a lot of, I don't know, machismo or something in, in baseball where, you know, you got to be the tough guy and you know everything and this and that. And, and it's okay. And I think that I think Craig Council is going to bring that to this team. Now, obviously, if you're hiring Council, you had to fire Ross, which obviously was not easy for any of us. And, and so here's what Jed had to say about that. I think David Ross could not have been easy. And so the way it's been reported, you showed up there. He wasn't expecting you. I, I, I imagine that had to be one of the more difficult conversations you've had as an executive. What was that process like in retrospect? And is it right to wonder what you learned from the process or what you k- took away from that because it was so delicate in nature and important and significant to the Cubs? Yeah, um, I guess I'd say this. I feel there's a, there's a part of me that's uncomfortable talking about this because it was someone's career that, and someone that I've known since 2008. I mean, I knew David when he was in, in, in Boston, you know, so um, that part was really hard. Um, and I think I've said a number of times, I look at it like, you know, if a decision is unbelievably hard and I'm still willing to do it, it means I feel like it's the, the right thing to do. And that's how I felt about this, that, um, yeah, it made me sick to my stomach, the, the idea of, of flying to, you know, down there to – to talk to David, uh, it was, uh, you know, because I think he's a really good manager, because I think he's a really good person. Um, and I think it was, without a doubt, the most difficult conversation in my career, as it would have to be. Um, but I felt like, you know, I have a responsibility to this organization to, to make hard decisions. Um, 
I've made a bunch of them. I, you know, listen, I, a lot of players that I got to know really well, I had to make really hard decisions on in, in 21 as well. So I think that's part of the job that you have to be, I want to be relatable. I want to be close to guys, but ultimately my responsibility is to the Cubs, to these people, to, to the Ricketts. And I have to, I have to always keep that in mind. That, that to me was pretty intense, man. I mean, how yeah. uncomfortable yeah, it is. was. It is. You know? yeah. really, that's a good point. Really, really intense. But it is. That's why these guys get paid this kind of dough, because it is an incredibly difficult job. It's it, it, you're, you're building relationships, and eventually you have to end relationships. I mean, you know, they always say, you know, these types of jobs, right, Crawley, you're, you're hired to be fired but somebody has to make that decision and spending all the time that you do with that person, you definitely create a relationship with them. So it's not always easy to pull the plug. I mean, you think about it. I mean, Jed was part of the guys that, you know, drafted Anthony Rizzo. They stuck with him through his cancer diagnosis. He got, he brought, he traded for Jed when he was a GM in San Diego. And then they brought him to the Cubs and watched him catch the final out. And it was Jed who had to ultimately trade him. And, and, when you think about David Ross and all this stuff, like knowing him since 2008 with Boston, they had the history. And, and, and the thing, of the, I think what Jed said when he said the fact that if something bothers me that much, but I still do it, right, I know it has to be the right decision. And, and I, I really, really feel that this is the right decision, and I hate that it happened to David Ross. But like, like Jed said, ultimately, he, you know, it's to the organization that he – his ultimate allegiance has to go to. And so, absolutely. I mean, yes, it has to, I mean, that's who pays, that's who pays his salary, right? He's got to make all the best decisions for the Cubs organization without a doubt. So after Jed and Carter kind of have their say afterward, next after that was the compound with the end uh, half. And that was pretty fun. But then comes Boog Shiambi out and he's talking with Craig Council and they have a relationship um, going back to when uh, Boog was um, announcing in Miami and, yeah. and Craig Council was a Marlin. So it was cool because you got to see that, you know, they had a good relationship just like he did with David Ross. Boog did. Um, but, you know, one of the things that he, again, right away wanted to talk about was was the idea of culture. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we spend a lot of time, you know, after we lose a game, <laughs> figuring out, like, what move did I, did we make that caused us to lose the game, right? Um, and really, and, and that's, that's important that we, you know, self-evaluate. But what's more important really is on a, on a daily basis, um, you know, how we treat each other, you know, in the room, in the clubhouse, because uh, ultimately that leads to, to performance by the players. And ultimately, the, ultimately, my job is um, to, to put the players in the best position and to create a place for them where they can be their best, their best selves. Um, and how we do that is just, it's really, that's our culture. And that we determine that every day uh, by kind of how we behave with each other. Um, and you don't, you don't give a speech to make it happen. Um, you live it every single day. Uh, that, that's how this works. There, there's no... You know, they, they get to write a lot of books about coaches and leaders and things like that. Um, but it's about how you do it every single day that, that, that makes this thing tick and makes this thing go. And, um, you know, that's what you set out to do. Now, I don't think that he, you know what I mean? Like, like, like when I thought of David Ross, just kind of a gritty kind of baseball rat. You know what I mean? A guy that just lives, eats, sleeps baseball. And with Joe Madden, he was totally kind of, you know, and um, when you think about Dusty Baker and those guys, you kind of think about, you know, kind of like the avant-garde, thinking about other things other than baseball. Council's an interesting guy to me because every time he was asked a question, he's very, like, ref like he thinks for a second before he answers it. And it's hard to kind of get off just these clips that we're playing. But, like, in, in that middle of that conversation with Boog, he doesn't just have the answer right away. He takes a second to kind of think about it. And then he kind of goes on with his answer. He's just a, he's he's very different from any manager, Cubs manager that I've ever seen before. Yep, and that's I think what is another one of the selling points on the guy, right? That's another reason why uh, they were attracted to go out and hire this guy, bring him in. Now, um, Boog was asking about getting acclimated because you know Craig gets hired. What was it? Uh, November or early November? You know, and all the players are 
scattered all over the place. Cubs convention was really the first time where Craig got to meet a lot of the different players and coaches and all be together in one place. So this is how he felt about that. The people's the best part because like my job says manager and that means I'm managing people. Um, and so getting to meet the players really for the first time, most of them this weekend has been a great part. I got to spend a good couple of days with our coaching staff um, we got some great work done to just uh, kind of move the ball forward on, on spring training and some, on some season stuff. Um, so I, it makes me feel way more comfortable for sure um, going into, like I just heard, 33 days to the first spring training game, which is starting to feel close, right? Yeah, starting it does. to feel close. Yeah. Um, and, and that's exciting. I Boy, mean, say that again. How many days? <laughs> well, now we're down to about 20 something. So we're yeah, getting right, there. Exactly. We're getting there. We're getting there. But the thing that's interesting about it is that uh, they brought in, they flew in a lot of the prospects in prior to Cubs convention. I don't know how much earlier, if it was Monday or Tuesday, but that's why none of those guys got snowed out or, or any ah, problems okay. is that all of these guys were in here and they were doing some work, meeting with the coaches, all of that stuff. And so it was pretty cool that, that a, you know, Craig got to work with his managers for really the first time, you know, not just one-on-one -on -one conversations, but as a group, but also to have an opportunity to meet the young players. When I, you know, when I got asked to go by my season ticket rep to the um, Imanaga press conference, that's at the Lowe's hotel, which is next to uh, the Sheraton. And when I'm there, all of a sudden this big giant black bus pulls up. I don't know where it comes from. I, I don't know where they were prior but out comes literally, Dustin, every single top 30 prospect, all of them were, were coming off the bus. And I'm just sitting there like my eyes are like about the size of dinner plates. And, I, you know, I'm sitting there and I got I said, OK, if I could get one picture with somebody because I know how they are at the Lowe's. Lowe's is very like they're they're very strict there. They don't want the autograph hounds. They don't want anyone bothering the players that are there. I got one picture and that was with Kevin Alcantara, who's just absolutely, like I said, looks like a superstar. And so I did get a picture and of course they came running like, oh, I'm, oh, you know, just kind of, play. it's always, sometimes I think it's easier to play dumb uh, and ask for forgiveness. I don't know, but, but I, you know, I, I got a good picture with Kevin Alcantara, but this is what Craig had to say about young players. And it really, this answer really impressed me. Probably you, you know, it's funny. I was talking to Ben Zobrist about this and, and um, not exactly about that, but we were talking about how to, how young players should be treated and how you talk to young players. And, it, and it's really interesting. And I think Ian, Ian and Ben were just talking about that a little bit, actually. Um, I've, I've probably, like, learned more about trying to put myself in the shoes of a young player and, and really understand what that player is going through. In fact, I talked to some prospects yesterday, and, and when we think about it, like, you know, we all do this to these young men. Like, there's there's ten prospects here from the Cubs, and we we glorify them immensely, right? And we tell them how great they are, and they're going to be the the next superstar of the Cubs. And then they get here, and the major leagues is incredibly hard. And more often than not, they have a little failure to start this thing. Um, and then we're like, ah, oh, he's not going to be the guy. But that's he is still going to be the guy. We we have to help him be the guy still. That goes from me. That comes from you, right? Um, and I think that's really important. And and that's going to be a really important part of I think this generation of Cubs baseball. There are some very very talented young players coming, and you will start to see them this year. Not all of them will come here and be great the first day they're here but I, all of our jobs right is to support them and help them become that player because at some point these kids are so talented they will become those that generation that leads us to championships i mean his that, lips to god's ears carly <laughs> his lips to god's ears right there i'm just gonna say this is that like i was kind of frustrated because i'm in a lot of cubs facebook groups and all sorts of stuff like that i'm on twitter all the time at carly's cubs and I cannot tell you how many people have given up about Pete Crow Armstrong. Dustin, he had 19 at bats, right. 19 at bats. Okay. This is a, tr Ryan Sandberg was one for his first 35. I mean, is it, we have gotten to the point, like he said, where we build these guys up. Think about Matt Mervis. Think about Matt Mervis. He had t-shirts made, they had t-shirts made for him. He was the next big thing. Matt Mervis, Matt Mervis. 
And then everyone complained when, you know, he didn't, he wasn't, you know, right away, Pete Alonso. I mean, that that's not normal. It's not normal to just walk into the major leagues and just take it over. That is extremely rare. And all I'm saying is, is, is for Cub fans to have a little bit of patience with these young guys, there's going to be bumps in the road. I can tell you that much. And, and I feel that there is a lot of talent here, but if we're all we're going to do is just sit there and rip them and tear them down. And I understand it. You know, some people get frustrated sometimes and that postseason collapse last year was bad, but, but give these kids a shot, let, let, let them. And I, I think that like, again, I think that is why we have Craig council in Chicago is he is going, I feel that they believe that he is the guy that's going to be able to get the most out of the young guys where I feel like David Ross is more like, give me the grizzly vet guy. You know what I mean? Right. But I think they believe that if Craig council was managing the Cubs last year, they would have been in the tournament. It could have been, could have been. I think and, that's and, what they believe. I think that's what they believe. I think they this, believe he's worth that many more wins. A hundred percent. And and when you look here, Boog kind of brings up a couple of names that our, our listeners will recognize when they're talking about prospects and the fact that there isn't just a linear progress. It's not just going one direction. It's like a roller coaster with ups and downs for these young players. And this is what both Boog and, uh, and Craig, they had a really interesting interplay on this one. Yeah, I mean, that, Derek's a great example. He he probably struck out 200 times as a rookie. Um, and he walked, you know, I remember that he was frustrated and he was down. And, and, and you just, the best thing that happened for him is that the, the manager, frankly, put him in the lineup the next day. And and because he he just and that faith and that confidence and, and he eventually figured it out and the, the cub the Cubs really got the benefit of that and yeah, they, they got a, they got a great player, um, but it, it there's there's countless examples of that. Um, you know, I mean one of the, the great examples of that for Cubs fans is, is Greg Maddox. Um, you know what Greg Maddox looked like his his just think Greg Maddox one of the best pitchers of all of all time. Look at his first year in the major leagues. I don't think any you if you look at that and you watched Cubs games and went to Cubs games that year, I don't know if you would have predicted it. Yeah, the first season, he was a four-seam fastball guy with a curveball. And I still remember, I said, your first year where you overmatched. And he said to me, no, I was overscared. <laughs> Which is a pretty good line. That's a great line. I mean, that's just real, though. You know what I'm saying? That it was, it was, it was scary for him. And we got to remember that sometimes uh, that's going to take place. All right. I'm going to tell you, Dustin, that if I had like a, a list of fly the W, you get to interview a guy. Greg Maddox would probably be in my top three because he has a lot of great quotes. He's obviously a smart guy. But but the first guy that he was bringing up was Craig Council's old teammate and and former Cub, Derek Lee. And, and so just kind of this idea of, oh, they have to be this, they have to be that. And if they're not, they're garbage. Derek Lee struggled. Okay. He, he struggled when he started playing his very first year with the Marlins in 1998. In 1999, he had to split time. He's going back and forth on the shuttle between uh, Florida and their AAA affiliate. Yep. And I think we know what, what came of Derek Lee, but it wasn't overnight. He didn't come in dominating and neither did Greg Maddox, arguably one of the greatest pitchers of all time. Definitely the greatest I'd say that you and I got to see pitch, right, Dustin? Yeah. I mean, right, right up there. If not, I mean, right, right up there. But I mean, in 1986, he was two and four. How about 1987, Dustin? Six and 14. Yep. And then in 19, well, now there's where you would, there's eight. where the, the people that would argue that wins and losses don't matter. But I think back then they did a little bit more. I mean, you know, it, it's it's just the idea of you could of this was a guy that in general what didn't well, plus look, he wasn't an over he wasn't a guy that was you know wasn't a swing and miss guy, right? Mm -hmm. Not overpowering stuff, no real presence. You know, if you were if you're doing a schoolyard pick, Greg Maddox, you know, kind of looks like you know a dumpy unathletic guy, right? <laughs> just being honest, right? Schoolyard right. pick, he's not getting picked right away. No, no, I, I hear what you're saying. And, and so I'm just looking at that and I say to myself, you know, those are just two examples. And, and Greg Maddox wasn't outmatched. He was out scared is what he said. And, and yeah, great line. think, great think line. about that, man. Just, just absolutely unbelievable. And Dustin, the last kind of clip I want to play is, is about this idea that you and I have talked about, about some fresh eyes. 
And, and so, you know, we have a new farm director and, and, and obviously a new coach. So some fresh eyes to look at some of these young players. That part's you, when you're, when one plays for a long time, you take that for granted a little bit. And so the new part is, um, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's exciting. Sometimes you need it, but the, like with players, I think the best thing, uh, like the, really the conversation in my head has been. Like, how much do I want to know about the players and how much do I just want to see for the first time when I get to Mesa and, and watch them play and not make any judgments um, and, and just just really see them with my own eyes and, and not be biased about anything? Like, I think one of my jobs always is to, to, to not get – to listen to everybody um, – but not get too swayed by any, any one thing. And, and that's how you, I think you make good decisions um, is take in a lot of information. Don't let any of those inputs kind of get too powerful. And, and then you make really good decisions. So like, I can't wait to see Hayden Wisniewski throw a baseball. Um, I've always like been kind of in, been interested in him. Um, and he's always excited me. Um, but I almost don't want to hear about last year because of that. How about that one? Right, He's he wants really to see hot to trot eyes. about Hayden Wisniewski. You like that? I mean, d- doesn't that make you wonder though what he saw there? Something it feels like he saw there, yep. and when he came want to get, he team, wants to get his hands on him, right? Absolutely. And in 2022, I mean, we he was was nasty. Like we were so excited. He had the immaculate inning. Uh, he came in three and two, two eighteen ERA. I mean, he only started four games. Obviously, it's small sample size, but it just looked dominant. And then, you know, he wins the job in, in uh, spring training. And then 2023 was a dud, I would say. He, he won the job, but he went three and five, 463 ERA, went back and forth from the minors, was not that dominant presence that we saw in 2022. But that's the thing is that Craig saw something and I want to know what he saw and what he's going to tinker with. And those are the kind of things right now, Dustin, that, that have me really excited to see what he's going to do. And when we get together later in the week, we get into Craig's in-game philosophies and, and that really got me stoked. So I'm excited. You are listening to the fly, the W six seventy podcast. It's season three. It's episode seven, the philosophy of Craig council, part one of two in this segment, Crowley is talking to Wayne Mesmer about his 37th Cubs con, the famous 1991 All-Star Game anthem, and a very special moment that occurred at Cubs con bingo this year. You gotta, you're got to you not going to want to miss this. Joining me now on the fly, the W Podcast, we are happy to have on our old friend Wayne Mesmer. Wayne, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Uh, fortunately, the heat is working. You know, the furnace is fired up. So uh, we're good. We're good. Coming off that, you know, yet another Cubs con. You know, I'm still kind of giddy about it because I, I this was this had a different feel and it was it was pretty positive in, in so many ways. Yeah, I was going to ask you, because, Wayne, you are the really kind of the kickoff to um, the Cubs convention. If everyone knows, you know, you get into the grand ballroom for opening ceremonies and it when you come out and you do that anthem. Look at that picture, Wayne. There he is, boy. Now, look, at, if you are on the 670, uh, the uh, score on the YouTube channel, this is a phenomenal picture of Wayne right there singing the anthem. But when you look out to that crowd, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, there's going to be nobody here. The weather's awful. There's going to be no one at Cubs Con. I'll get every autograph I want. And by the end of it, that place was packed. You know, it's uh, it's it really is a tribute to the to the passion of Cubs fans over the years. And it's funny because we keep flip flipping generations you know and it's not like you know my grandfather well okay gramps is gone and you know my parents used to well they're not coming this year and so it's us and we're you know bringing kids and those kids are 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 fans and uh not just i like the you know i love the cubs i mean you could talk to them about players and uh uh, the batting averages and, you know, win loss and what they hope for. And uh, let's sign Bellinger, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's fun. It, it has been fun. I've done every, every one of them. So uh, from the Hyatt to the Hilton, to the Sheridan, you have been to go. all 37. The world tour. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's, it's, it's obviously some things change and, and some things stay the same. But I guess the thing that I'm always looking at for me is, is, you know, when you do that anthem, I always get, you know, tingles up the spine and all that stuff, the goosebumps. But we just passed an anniversary a couple of days ago on Friday, right? January yeah. 19th, yeah. 1991, yes, All-Star Game in Chicago. And for people that don't know, the, the, the Blackhawks were hosting the anthem or were hosting the All-Star Game. And as usual, you were going to sing the anthem. But this was right before Desert Storm starts. And it was every- right after. It was a day and a half after. Because I remember being in a restaurant Thursday night when uh, the news came on that we had started, you know, firing away and using real bullets. And people were confused and scared and concerned, obviously. And this was Saturday afternoon. Um, and, you know, the, the thing that, that people don't understand is, um, you know, the Canadian national anthem needed to be done with as much respect as the U.S. because the Canadian troops were involved in this as well. But uh, there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, the crowd had been making a lot of rackets since uh, 85, you know, during the U.S. anthems. Um which is where it began. So those who think it's something new, I need to break it to you. <laughs> um, but that particular day, man, the emotion was just intense. And uh, I knew at that moment, you know, I, I often talk about that moment and say, when what you are God gifted to do and requested by your fellow man to do, it's rare when they meet in the same intersection, that was it. If ever it needed to be done right, that, that was a, uh, that was a moment. I'll tell you the thing about it is that like a, a typical guy after, after doing it, I was, I mean, I was soaking wet, sweating from uh, just the excitement of it and tears. I mean, I knew what had just happened. So then we came home and, uh, Kathleen and I were just hanging out. It was an afternoon. And then that evening, every five o'clock, six o'clock and 10 o'clock newscast, local and national opened and closed with a clip of the anthem. And I thought, man, that was not, not dropping the baton when it was handed to me, you know? Uh, and I can, I mean, I can go back to that moment and just Wow. I mean, like yesterday, I sang at a high school hockey game. And you know what? It's exactly the same thing that I did. And some people don't get that, you know, whether it's, you know, the World Series or Stanley Cup playoffs or Calder Cup playoffs or or NHL All-Star game or NBA finals, whatever it might be, or Bears game. uh, It's still exactly the same thing that I'm being asked to do. And, uh, uh, I always want to bring the A game, you know, if, if I can. Oh, and you know, you, you always do. And, and, and I thought this was fantastic. And so, you know, we go into all the sessions and all that stuff. And as usual, you know, the sessions end, they clear out the room, they clear out the rift raft from upstairs <laughs> and then the lines start forming for bingo and they get, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the waiting in the line of people for bingo. If you've ever seen it, it yeah. is a, a sea of humanity. It's unbelievable. I saw somebody Friday night and I said, what are you doing outside the ballroom? We're waiting for bingo. I said, it's tomorrow night. We know. They said. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's Wayne. I'm not going to, I'm not going to kind of give you a hard time. It's 22 years for me. And uh, I thought this was the lucky card. We even took a picture. It looked all oh. good. I'm smiling. And I, I don't know what happened, Wayne. I thought we had an arrangement of some kind. Uh, I, I, I 22, 22, oh, and 22. And people keep asking me, why are you a CubsCon bingo legend at oh, and 22? I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, Kathy, someone at your table did win. So, uh, you know, and she was a, the only winner of that particular game. We do 20 games. Think about it. With 4,000 people in that ballroom. Your odds are not great, <laughs> you know. Uh, my favorite thing is, I mean, obviously, I, you know, I mean, I didn't grow up to be the bingo master, but uh, it, it still is funny, and I'm sure I've told you this, you know, outside uh, Wrigley a few years ago, there's a, a multiple generations, you know, the grandma, she pinches my cheek. Oh, I remember you from blah, 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 blah. 
you know, 30 some years ago. The mom says, oh, I remember you from Z95 when you were doing the morning shows there in Chicago. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. And the little kid has big eyeballs just looking at me. You're the bingo guy. <laughs> you know, so forget the fact that you've sung with the symphony and sung in all the major places. And it, World it, Series? It comes World Series? <laughs> it's... Uh, yeah. It pales in comparison to being the bingo. <laughs> I, I, I do have to tell you, we did have some good auctions. I thought you guys had some really good auction items. And there's a photo of you. And that was a Christopher Morell photo. I think it went for two grand. Yeah. Um, but, but there was some mad bidding going on. We had our friend Jonathan Evans. He won a big Magnum bottle of something signed by Ben Zobrist. It was it was pretty heated in there, right? It's funny. I saw him uh, when I was getting the car in the uh, in the parking garage. He was rolling out. And uh, Kathleen was here. She goes, I know what you have in that box. It looked like, a, you know, she was a, like a carrying a King Tut in the uh, <laughs> in the burial box. I wonder if we're going to crack that thing open. Well, I hope so. And I hope to be there when he does, you know, but it was, as, yeah. as you know, uh, like you said, it was one of the things that cracked me up a little bit, Wayne, is, is that, you know, there was a couple, you know, the, since the Cubs, they they redid all the flags that have flown over beautiful historic Wrigley Field. Right. They put every Hall of Famer on the out exterior there. So there's a lot of new flags. Right. And like you said, our friend Kathy Weedley won <laughs> a Holbert flag. And I was dying laughing because there was a few flags. And Wayne, you and I are no slouches. We're no Johnny come lately. We've been around a little yeah. while. We had some trouble with some of these flag names. And thank God. <laughs> Thank God for Cub historian Ed Hardig, right? It was great when he came up, you know, because I go, you know, flag was flown over historic really field with the name of, huh? What? <laughs> Who is this guy? You know? So, yeah, you're right. Then the, uh, you know, the, the Cubs historian came up. We brought him up at least twice, maybe three times. Whatever. But it was pretty good. And then I had the wrong, they gave me the wrong uh, notes on a card. One of them. He goes, no, that's that's not right. So, <laughs> but no. you know, it, it was it was a lot of fun, you know. And and if you did, and if you look at this picture, Kathy doesn't care that she didn't get Ernie Banks or Billy Williams. She got Holbert, who I still am not sure of. But look at the smile on her face, man. Oh, Anybody that wins bingo, I keep saying, Wayne, if I ever win, I'm going to do like a John Belushi cartwheels up to the up to the stage. When let's just say when you win, <laughs> I'll I'll bring you up on the stage. <laughs> now another great moment and Wayne I, I know that you know sometimes you marry above your league and no offense to you but you know you have a fantastic wife and and you mentioned about your anniversary we talk in 50 right 40 yeah 40 why do I think 50 40 here's a picture of Kathleen and your daughter right before you came out and you know we had to give her love and I think that the Kathleen Mesmer chant uh we had fun. We had a, I think it was pretty soon it pretty came up the whole room chanting Kathleen Mesmer. She had great. to have been on cloud nine. It was great. You know, uh, it's funny because uh, we have a, a group of dear friends, yourself included, but a group of about eight guys that we met at bingo probably 16, 15, 16 years ago and just hang out, you know, together. And they come from all over the place. Uh, Indiana, St. Louis, even, and uh, <clears throat> we all sit together during the the downtime, you know, in the lobby, and uh, you know where to find us, right by the organ there, and so we're hanging out, and all of a sudden, Kathleen and I are sitting on the same chair together, like a couple of teenagers, and we look up, and they're all just standing in a semicircle, looking around, looking at us, I'm going, gee, man, it's like being on, you know, like, uh, you know, being waked and looking at what's going on here. All of a sudden, boom, they open up a, they, uh, a big cake, a huge cake shows up. Now, it says, uh, happy anniversary. I can explain why. We did years ago. Kathleen was a teacher for many years. And I came out to sing at some assembly with her. And we sang it in the local paper. Oh, my God. I never heard the, I still have never heard the end of this. It said, uh, you know, Wayne Mesmer and companion in a local paper. And she had been teaching there for years. And I said, oh, God, you know, I'm going to catch the heat for this. So <laughs> on the cake, it says, because our friend Dave, 
uh, had it made, and it said, "Happy 40th anniversary, Wayne and Companion." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, she had to have loved that. So that that chant to me was really special and seeing, you know, seeing her her face and 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 that. But there was a really another special moment in Bingo. And and, and you know, sometimes it's just weird. Like w- with Cubs convention, you meet people and things happen and, and and sometimes you know, you think like, "Oh, I want to meet the players. I want to do this." But it really it sounds so cheesy, but it's kind of the friends you make along the way, those special moments that you're really not expecting. And um for people that aren't aware of Cubs Con Bingo, it is a tradition. Everyone wants to win. And when someone yells bingo, you boo the <laughs> heck out of that person. So as that person is walking up to claim their prize, the boos come cascading from the crowds right. and, and it gets loud. But but and I, this- and I don't at all try to suppress that by any means. <laughs> You know, if you even think that you're going to come up here with a fake card <laughs> or what my favorite Wayne is when, when somebody sends a child, right. Just, just oh, to yeah, take, yeah, yeah. take the human shield, the human right. shield. Yeah. <laughs> uh, brother. But, but we did have someone special that ended up um, winning a bingo game and I brought him on here. His name is Brian Witt. Let me bring him in here. Brian, how you doing, buddy? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you? Oh, we're doing great. And Brian, the reason I brought you on is, is that, you know, it just seemed like I was I was talking with Wayne about this moment. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, how long have you been a Cub fan, Brian? So I've been a Cub fan, well, ever since I can remember. But, um, you know, I'm 35 years old, so I grew up watching, you know, Mark Gray, Sammy Sosa, John Lieber. <laughs> yeah, so I've been a Cub fan for a while. Um, yeah. And so, Brian, you're sitting there, and how many Cubs cons would you say you've been to? Besides this most recent one, I went to the 15 Cubs convention. Uh, Fantastic time, but I did not win bingo, so that was pretty pretty sad. So 2015 (laughs) is your first Cubs con bingo, and, and you didn't win. And so, you know, Brian, um, you come 2022 and you come with your brother. Is that right? Brother-in-law, yeah. Brother-in-law. Yeah. And so you're with your brother-in-law. You're sitting down at a table. And all of a sudden, you know, you're sitting there and your numbers are getting called. And it has to be getting close, right? Like, you have to be like, I- I'm getting close. I'm getting close. Do you remember what type of game we were playing when you won? I think it was the X game. Uh, oh. you, had to, you had to get an X. Uh, certainly, I remember the last number, C3. Which was? I'm sorry, which one was it? It was an X game, and the number was C3. Was C3. The last number. Yeah. Oh, man. Could you imagine if it would have been C4 way and the place would have gone nuts? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a little boom, right? But, uh, yeah. Brian, tell us a little bit about yourself. You, you, you're a lawyer? Yeah, I'm a lawyer uh, in St. Charles. Um, so we, we live uh, he, out here in the country in Newark, Illinois. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I grew up being a Cubs fan. I love the Cubs. Um, you know, I cried when we won the World Series, although I was sick, I will admit. Um, but I will tell you, it's always been a dream of mine to go come back to Cubs Con and win that bingo. So, and honestly, I never thought it would happen. So, <laughs> Well, you you have grown up with cerebral palsy. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Um, so I, I would well, I was I grew up with cerebral palsy a lot. Well, the only real thing that I can't do is, is write. Uh, but but certainly my disability is physical and it uh, is very visible. And uh, I actually had a stroke about seven years ago, uh, which kind of made my mobility uh, that much worse. So. Um, that's kind of why my brother-in-law came up to the stage with me because, well, honestly, well, number one, I would add a whiskey or two, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but number two, uh, my mobility is not great whatsoever. So. so to be honest, Brian, when you won, the booze come cascading as is tradition, but as you walk up there, and and you you are literally I thought I I because I you were right to the little left corner of us right there and you started to come up and all of a sudden I'm like man look at this guy go you were so excited and and all of a sudden 
people started to cheer. It, those boos turned to cheers. Yeah. And as you made your way up there, the entire crowd is roaring and on their feet for you. How did you feel at that moment? <laughs> surreal. It was, uh, it was surreal. It was something that I've never experienced. Um, I've always looked at myself as being kind of a regular guy uh, and kind of ignore uh, the disability, the inspiration, whatever you want to call it, that I, that I give off or whatever. And um, quite frankly, I think at that moment, I, I realized, you know, this isn't, this is going to sound weird, but this isn't pity. Um, it, it, it's celebration. Um, and, and that's kind of, uh, what made it so memorable for me, I think. So you could feel the, the whole crowd. And, and I think that I started the chant, the Brian chant too. Then <laughs> after that, it's like, wait a minute. If you were to go through all 4,000 with all respect, Crowley, if we were to go through all 4,000 and said, uh, okay, who do you want to win? I want this guy to win. I want this guy, Brian, to win, you know? And again, uh, your, your, uh, well, let's call it March of Victory. <laughs> That's very up, nice. <laughs> up the stage was so cool that it's like, you know what? This is, this is the family feel. We know this guy. We don't know him, but we know him now. And the, the crowd is just cheering and chanting. And, uh, I, I could not have been happier. <laughs> Nor could Brian, I. Look at that. There, look how happy you are here. There has to be a picture of you with your brother-in-law. Why don't you tell the listeners what exactly you want at Bingo, my friend? I want a uh, historic flag that flew over Wrigley Field. Uh, Jackie the Robinson. <laughs> a Jackie Robinson flag. Mm, yep. Okay, that's a good one. Yep. Yeah. Uh, a Nico Horner sign ball. And, oh. and a gift card, a $100 gift card to Swift and Sons Tavern. <laughs> you know, that sometimes the prices aren't that great, Brian, but you cleaned house on that one. Single and, winner on that. That's awesome. You take the whole thing. That's and he, cool. he takes it all, Brian. And, and you know, I got to tell you that next year, you know, okay, I feel good for you this year. Next year, <laughs> if you win again, I'm not going to be as nice to you. I, I may, but, but. Honestly, man, um, I talked to you a little bit earlier. I have a cousin who has uh, cerebral palsy and, and, you know, just, uh, just, you know, you're more than that, man. You're a lawyer, you, you've accomplished so much and, and you're a Cub fan. And for me, you know, that's what we all celebrate is Cub fans helping Cub fans. And we're just super proud that you were able to win. And we're looking, and if anyone listening right now, we're looking for anyone that has any video, any phone video of it. Um, we're looking for it, and you can contact me at flythew at gmail.com. If you have, we'd love to have any video that you might have of that moment. Um, Brian, thank you so much for jumping on, buddy. Thank you, Crawley. Have a good one. Thank hey, you, Wayne. High five. Wayne, that was, like I said, a really special moment. And and honestly, there are so many that happen at Cubs Convention. I just think that people that kind of look down on Cubs Convention don't really get what it's all about. No. Um, it is about fans. It is about family. It is about friends. And and. This was just a that ideal moment. Well, you know, it is funny because the bingo has evolved into the single most uh, popular event of the weekend. And uh, uh, I tell players, I said, have you ever just stuck your head in into the ballroom for bingo? No, bingo. <laughs> yeah. It's not all just, you know, sitting there for an hour and then waiting to get out, you know, to go to a restaurant for you guys. It's uh, this is this is the real thing, man. This is this is the family get together. You know, you, you share a table with your friends that you've known for years or you've just met. And uh, it's funny. I mean, how many people come up to me? The answer is countless. Uh Call my number tonight. Okay, well, <laughs> I'll try. You know, if it comes up, here's here's an idea. Now, you being a, you know, a bingo wannabe winner. <laughs> I, first of all, the screens that they're now using are way cooler. Now you can see what the numbers are, even though I shout them out. But I think we need, and this is Kathleen's idea. She said we need a split screen to show what numbers have been called. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, that would that would uh, eliminate somebody coming up 
with a card that isn't right, you know, that's not oh, a winner. Yeah. So I'm thinking, well, maybe we won't do that then, you know, because that's part of the fun. You know, if you come up here with a fake card, we give you a one-way ticket to St. Louis, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> I got to tell you, Wayne, I'm mad at myself. I'm going to tell you why I'm mad at myself is that, you know, you always do a great Christmas show at Hey Nani's in Arlington Heights. And you know me trying to get everybody involved. I'm trying, hey, guys, let's get tickets for Wayne's show, blah, blah, blah. Sold out like that. Two months well, in advance. While I'm sitting there trying yeah. to get the table together, it sells out from under me. And I'm saying to myself, my God, that that just kind of goes to tell you the popularity of that um, Christmas show. And so do you have any other performances coming up, Wayne? Um, I, I got a ton of them. Um, let's see what's around. I got some stuff coming up in the spring up in, uh, let's see, in Huntley. Uh, I got some things down in Palos. You know, so I mean, I'm spreading the love. I do a lot, and I don't know whether I've told you this or not. I do about a, a hundred or so, or over a hundred performances a year at senior communities. Mm. And uh, I roll in, and I call it Wayne Messmer's Traveling Piano Bar, and uh, come in with a keyboard, sound system, and a, a lot of silly dad jokes, and and give an hour show of music. And I'll tell you, the the, the vocal performance that I will do is equal to anything that is downtown, you know, uh, good songs, fun songs. And, uh, you know, the shtick begins the moment I walk into the facility, you know, it's, Hey ladies, hide your purses. The musicians here, you know, that kind of silly <laughs> stuff. Oh, we're so happy you're here. It's, it's so rewarding. Um, and so fulfilling, uh, to perform for people who number one, yeah, I, I, I'm not thin-skinned, but I mean, I, I love, I like when people like me. That's <laughs> nice, and uh, these people really do because uh, many of them, uh, long-time Cub fans, and you know, so they've seen that. Oh, say can you see? But now I prove that I know more than one song. You know, <laughs> and uh, that's been a lot of fun. So, but I, I um, on my website, which is just WayneMesmer.com, uh, I, I have my complete schedule of everything. And also on Facebook, you have a page for Wayne Mesmer's music, correct? We do indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And so for people that are interested, like I said, Wayne is not a one trick pony. This guy sings all the standards and, and anytime you have a chance to catch him, I've, you know, I've come to numerous shows and always, my wife and I always enjoy ourselves. And, and Wayne, where can people follow you on uh, Twitter? Uh, just Wayne Mesmer. That's it. Wayne Mesmer, CSP, I believe, or CSP, I think, I but uh, I don't know. it'll be easy to find. We're going to tag you on this Wayne, but you know what, man, uh, thank you again for making, you know, I think the thing is, is, is that Wayne, you know, over the years, it used to be like, you know, you would just walk in the hallways of Cubs convention. There'd be players just standing around talking to people, shooting the breeze. Mm -hmm. And it gets a little bit tougher nowadays, but you kind of, you and Fergie and a couple other people, Bobby D's another one, kind of keep the tradition of kind of just hanging out with the people and, you know, just the kindness and with your time and taking pictures with people and just giving people smiles and memories. Um, it just goes above and beyond. And we appreciate you, Wayne. And, and, and uh, thank you again so much for coming on today. Well, you're, those are nice words and I take them to heart. You know, I, I've always said, how tough is it to be nice to people who are being nice to you? You know, and all the, all the people want is to know that you're approachable, you know, and uh, would you mind if I, do, would you mind if I trouble you? You know, it's not a trouble. Come on, get over here. You know, let's, let's grin and take a good photo. And, uh, you know, I can't tell you, of course, how many how many Christmas cards those pictures end up on, you know, <laughs> but it's great. You know, I mean, and what a wonderful thing to be known for, uh, number one, association with the Chicago Cubs, but also um, the guy who sings the anthem. And I've done it for so many different, well, all of the teams, but uh, entering uh, year number 40 with uh, with the Cubs. 40 years with the Cubs, 40 years with Kathleen. You're a very lucky man, Wayne. Thank Amen, you so brother. much for jumping on. <laughs> All right. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, my friend. Sign belly. You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast. It's episode seven of season number three, The Philosophy of Craig Council, part one. Don't forget to listen, download, subscribe to the Fly the W podcast, and don't forget to give us those five-star reviews. Check us out on all the social media platforms. 
All right, Crowley, not a ton of moves happening, but uh, somebody associated with Craig Council is uh, signed up to uh, throw in the American League for some big dollars. Yeah, you're you're looking here, and we were talking about the uh, the we need the Jed and Carter were talking about bullpen help, right? Well, there's been movement in the uh, reliever market. Josh Hader will not be rejoining his old skipper at. He signed a five-year, $95 million contract to play with the Astros. No way Jed was touching that contract no, with a 10-foot pole. No, 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 no. I mean, God, God bless Josh Shader for getting that, but I, I don't think that's a very good move by the Astros. But We'll see. I. Reliever Robert Stevenson signed a three-year, $33 million contract with the Angels, and the White Sox signed reliever John Brebbia to a one-year $5.5 million deal. Let's see. Now, that's just one of those taking a flyer ones. Um, but Jed was asked at CubsCon about the, you know, the free agent mark, about uh, relief pitchers, and, and he said something surprising. He said, we've offered some multi-year contracts this offseason. It's not my favorite thing in general, but certainly the bullpen is an area of priority. It's a hard area. You look at teams that have built through multi-year deals that have struggled, and you look at some teams that have built through smart, targeted transactions that have had a lot of success. There's a lot of ways to skin the bullpen, cat, but we need to focus on it. It was an Achilles heel last year for sure. And, and so I was surprised that they were offering those multi-year contracts. If you look, if you were reading in the athletic shot, Sahad of Sharma wrote that, you know, Bill Matten, David Robertson, who the Cubs had a couple of years ago and Ryan Stanek are relievers that kind of interest Jed, but you know, it, it's, we're, uh, you know, 30 days till the less than 30 days before the first spring training game. It's, it's, you got to start making those moves and you assume it's going to be relatively quickly, relatively soon. If you're going to do something now, Dustin, I don't know if you saw this on Twitter, but uh Cespit is BBQ. He's a guy that, you know, it's, it's, it's an account that's pretty big. Look at this, Dustin MLB uh, top free agents, top 50 unsigned Last year at this time, roughly 118, 2023, there was only three Andrew Chafin, Michael Walker, and Jerickson Profar. That was it. Yeah, just, was and those signed. are just, and those are just guys, you know, those are just guys. And roughly we're talking about the same, in the same time period, one year later, 118, 24, Bellinger, Snell, Montgomery, Matt Chapman, Hader just got signed. Solaire, JD Martinez, Hoskins, Clevenger, Araldis Chapman, Lorenzen, Rosario, Merrifield, Justin Turner, uh, Brandon Belt. I mean, Tim Anderson. I mean, he had a bad year. Nobody wants to take a flyer on Tim Anderson. Yeah, I, I mean, you have not heard a word about that guy. I mean, I haven't heard a syllable. I mean, is this collusion? Are the I mean, are the owners just trying to keep everybody down? Is that what's going on? Is that what they're going to claim? I, it is bizarre. It, it, it definitely is bizarre. Like you're telling me that you don't have a, you're not going to take a flyer on a guy that was like a, a perennial 300 hitter. I mean, yeah, I, I'm very, on. I'm very, very surprised by that. I am very, very surprised by that, but it's more surprising Crowley. It's this white Sox news. Since we mentioned the white Sox on the Cubs fly the W podcast, this uh, area in the South loop known as the 78 could be the future home of the Chicago white Sox. I thought it was interesting, Dustin, because if you remember when the Ricketts were going to do the renovations at Wrigley, the 1060 project, which, by the way, turned out just absolutely stunning, phenomenal, love it to death. But the first thing they did is they did ask the city for financial help to build the stadium. And the city said no. And so the Cubs then came back and countered and said, OK, well, how about a, you you suspend the 12 percent amusement tax? So if people don't know, there's a city tax and that you pay on each cup tickets, 12%. And they said, okay, well, why don't we just keep that 12% from the tickets we're selling and we'll use that to help rebuild the stadium. And the city said, no. And so I just thought it was interesting, Dustin, that now, you know, Jerry Reinsdorf is threatening Nashville. And now all of a sudden you got this area in the South loop, but Dustin, you know, I mean, he got Jerry Reinsdorf got the one of the biggest sweetheart deals. Oh in yeah, because he threatened to move the team to Tampa, one. right? He threatened to move the team to Tampa. He threatened to move to Tampa. There was all sorts of shenanigans where they unplugged a clock before the uh, shenanigans. The, I love I love shenanigans. Shenanigans, and so I just could you see Jerry Reinsdorf at whatever age willing to plunk down? I, the Ricketts put a lot of money into Wrigley, their own money 
into Wrigley Field. I mean, oh yeah, they did. You always hear you always hear about concrete, right? Right. Could you a, see they Jerry... love talking. They love talking about the concrete. You know, could you see Jerry before? Reinsdorf doing that though? I mean, no way. No, God, no. No, we'll we'll no, see what happens no, with no, that. No, I, I I don't see it. But uh, you know, after everything that they did as far as rejecting the Cubs. If if they give the White Sox one dollar, I'm going to be pissed off because they really <laughs> they they put the Cubs through the uh, ringer. Not, not you think about how many people come to Wrigley Field, how much tourist dollars. It's like we're the number one tourist attractions in Illinois, and you couldn't give them the twelve percent amusement tax. I mean, okay, right. that's fine if that's what you want to go with. But then I don't want to hear anything from Jerry Reinsdorf about getting money from the city. No way. Yeah, I I, it, I mean it's nice. The whole story is really nice. But until we know who's flipping the bill, it's kind of a, a non-starter. But the, the word is, now we had Bruce Levine on the Mully and Haw show this past Monday, so today, earlier today when we're recording this, and he says we could hear something as soon as this week on where this project's heading. It's going to be interesting, and that's why you got to make – you always got to tune into Mully and Haw, but especially those Bruce hits, man. They're they're always good stuff. Oh, those uh, are – that's must-listen radio. Before I even got into this business, that was much uh, listen uh, – Radio. I heard some uh, congratulations are in order that you want to pass out. Yeah, to a couple of great guys and friends of the podcast. They've both been on the Fly the W podcast numerous times. First off, congrats to Alex Cohen. He was awarded the 2023 Ballpark Digest Broadcaster of the Year. Way to go. Uh, Alex does just such a fantastic job. He actually did some spring training games for the score um, last spring. And so he is just a, a super talented guy. I've gotten to sit in the broadcast booth with them in, in, in Iowa and Des Moines, and he just does a great job. And it's just great to see that he was honored that way. So congratulations to Alex. Um, second to my friend, Stuart McVicker, the founder of club 400. He was awarded the Ron Santo inspiration award from the pitch and hit club of Chicago last Very weekend. Cool. Very cool. So um, just, just, you know, Stuart is $800,000 raised from a basement so far and and we're not slowing down anytime soon. But just to, to you know, nobody does nobody does that charity work just to get honors and acc accolades. But it's nice to be recognized. And there's not a guy that deserves it more than Stuart McVicker. Absolutely, congratulations to him and to all you guys with Club of Four Hundred. Yeah, um, Dustin. You know, before we went on air, there was some really sad news that as Cub fans we got, and and you know, I'm I'm really shook up about this. Uh, I think all Cub fans are right now. Ryan Sandberg on his Instagram, he wrote to my Cubs, to my Chicago Cubs, National Baseball Hall of Fame, extended baseball family, the city of Chicago, and all my loyal fans. I want to share some personal news. Last week, I learned that I've been diagnosed with metatastic prostate cancer. I've begun treatment. I'm surrounded by my loving wife, Margaret, and an incredibly supportive family, the best medical care team, and our dear friends who will continue to be positive, strong, and fight to beat this. Please keep us in your thoughts and prayers during this difficult time for me and my family. Ryan Sandberg. It's all you can do is be up, be Crowley. He's a young man. Uh, I know he's going to get the best care possible. If he's taking to social media the way he is, I'm imagining that um, he feels like he can share the news with everybody. But, uh, you know, everybody keep uh, Rhino in your uh, thoughts and prayers, obviously. Yeah. When I went to Cubs con and, you know, we were hearing about cancellations and stuff, well, we kind of joked around, well, you know, there's a couple guys like Dempster, Woody, Sandberg, they all got places in the area, you know, sub suburbs or in the city. And I was like, what? Ryan Sandberg's not at Cubs con. That was the first time since he was let go of managers of the Phillies that he wasn't there. So I'm like, was was he somewhere? Like, was he on vacation? I mean, I don't right. know. Plus just last year was such a big honor for him, right? With the, with the statue and everything. Right. And they were doing the whole thing with the 84 team and, you know, Sam right. part right. of it. So it's like this is something, I don't know what it was, but something I'm like, didn't okay. add up. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It didn't add up. And now, you know, on Instagram, he had now pictures of yeah. him and his family and there's a picture of him in the hospital. But like you said, Ryan Sandberg, if we know one thing is that he doesn't back down from a challenge no. and, and, and he's a, he's a fighter. And, and I, you know, I, I just, you hope for the best. And like you said, a young, a very fit, Younger man who hopefully, like you said, is going to be getting the best care. And 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 our thoughts and prayers go out to Rhino, the Sandberg family. Um, he's somebody that I, I know our age group, especially Dustin. He's the guy that hooked us. Absolutely the, right. Yeah, him and Andre Dawson for me, no doubt about that. Crowley, that's a wrap. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. 
Follow us on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram. Of course, we're on Twitter. You can email Crawley and I, fly the W670gmail.com. And now you can watch us. That's right. On YouTube by subscribing to the 670 The Score YouTube channel. Crowley, have a good week. We'll uh, hook up again Thursday. Absolutely. And we'll just say go Rhino and go Cubs. Hey guys, it's Crawley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!